up, guys? This is John Nelson, and you're listening to the Starting Block Podcast. Guys, this is a show for complete athletic development. If you're new to the show, welcome. I appreciate you. Here's how we operate, all right? As I said, this is for complete athletic development. Our mission, our objective, the whole reason we do this is to bring you guys, whether you're the athlete, the parent, or the coach, the tools, the resources you guys need to succeed. Uh, real talk, I'm just tired of hearing like coach-to-coach shows that just went over everybody's head, and so we're trying to bring you real information from real people um, so that you can implement it with uh, your team, your athletes, your family, et cetera. Um, Now, our show, we are different than your standard podcast. We actually have multiple shows within the show. The first episode that you're going to hear from us is our Q&A. That's bi-weekly. That's where myself and my co-host, Chris Scarborough. What's up, sir? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, guys. That's where Chris and I will take the questions y'all submit to us. Chris, where do they submit those questions? Info at startingblockpodcast.com. Yes, Um, Guys, those questions can be related to anything in our field, the strength, the performance, the rehab, the nutrition, you name it, we'll tackle it, all right? Um, That's Q&A, and as I say, I don't mind if you guys um, DM us, that's that's fine, but uh, just real talk, don't be disappointed if I forget to bring your question on um, because I just can't keep up with it, so shoot us an email, that'd be great, that way we can stay organized. Um, All right, so that is Q&A. Episode two is the other bi-weekly episode that is a guest interview that is like every other podcast on the planet that is where we're going to have a conversation with a colleague a friend of ours Um, guys we've had people from all around the world at this point which is pretty cool Um, and they're going to share their stories of success what they do with their clients their patients their athletes their teams and ultimately it's somebody that uh, you know you guys can connect with hopefully you know if we're in that area and it's something that might benefit you guys and it's kind of cool how that's um, how that network has developed and uh, that's what we have today and I'm going to bring our guest on here in just a second um that final episode all right we have one more is going to be this friday fire fact i do that about every quarter or so it's just 20 minutes of me just kind of giving you a little bit of insight into something related to our field uh you know i've been doing this 16 years now um you know there's just there's things for a lot of you young up-and-coming coaches um that if i can share and help man i'm, I'm happy to and so that's kind of what that uh, friday episode's about or it might just me be me going on a rant about something um and so that's how our show breaks down. Guys, we don't run ads on the show. Um, we simply ask that if you got value out of this, if this helped you, if it helped your team, your kids, anybody, guys, just bring us a friend. Just share the show, please. That's all we ask for. Uh, I feel like that's a very reasonable fee because um, this takes up a ton of our time. Uh, so just please share the show, guys. And, uh, yeah, I think that's probably about it. Do we cover everything, Chris? I think I got uh, I'm, it. Sure, I'm sure we missed something. But you know what? So what? Let's move on. Yeah, I think I got it all. Um, and I actually had the music on today, too, so that was <laughs> That's awesome. right, so, the music worked. Hey. Yeah, no kidding. Um, all right, so, um, yeah, today is a guest interview, and so it's, uh, we're pretty stoked. Uh, we're pretty excited to welcome Abby Lathrop from the Denver Nuggets onto the show. What's up, Abby? Hello. Woo-hoo. What's up, guys? It's good to have you. Greatly Thank appreciate you, you taking the time um, to join us. I know it's probably a particularly busy time of year, you know, right now. Always. <laughs> right in the middle of the season. Um, Thanks but, for having uh, me. Yeah. So Abby, uh, Abby's with the Denver Nuggets. Um, she is, uh, are, you're the nutritionist for the Denver Nuggets. Yep. Yeah? Performance dietitian. Performance dietitian. Yep. How long have you been with the Nuggets now? This is my third season. Yeah. That we're currently in right now. Yep. I started as a contractor in my first season and then was brought on full time second season. And now we're in the third somehow. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. What's it like? How, how do you like working in the NBA? Like I, I worked for the Grizzlies for a while. Yeah. So like I can kind of speak to you a little bit. Like, yeah. Yeah. You enjoying it? Like it's a little different than college it. athletics. It's, yeah. it's so different. Um, my background's in kind of all different types of sports, a little bit of football, a little bit of performance facilities um but basketball is really fun it's it's different in the sense that as you know like your roster is tiny you've got 15 17 guys whereas football you've got 65 including a practice Mm -hmm. squad so it's pretty cool just to kind of get to know people on more of a one-on-one basis including the staff too the staff is small as well so it's a lot of fun yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I enjoyed my time with the Grizzlies. I, I really did. And, yeah. um, you know, I miss doing it. I miss kind of being in that environment, but you know, I was called to you know do what I'm doing now. So, um, awesome. but yeah, cool. So how did you, uh, let's just start from the beginning, right? <laughs> like, let's say, uh, you know, like how, how did you get into athletics? You were an athlete yourself, right? You went to Penn state, correct? Yep. 
Yep. Yeah. So okay. I, I'll give you a spark notes version. I'll try to. Um, nah, there's no need for the spark notes version. We got we got an hour. Go so, into the details. Like, oh, let's beautiful. go. <laughs> yeah. So Fire I, away. yeah, I grew up playing sports. Um, I grew up playing soccer, basketball, and softball. Went to Penn State for undergrad, um, and was on the rowing team. I had never rowed until I got to campus, and they recruited me off campus because I'm really? six foot one. <laughs> you wow. can't tell okay. from Zoom call, but I'm no, called. no, I wasn't. Gonna guess that. <laughs> Well, it's um, funny because like one of our family's closest friends yeah. um, is my step is a stepdaughter. My stepdaughter's friend. She goes to University of North Carolina. She's a rower too. Yeah. She's a monster. Like yeah. I mean, I'm scared of her. Like she <laughs> beat me up. Like so, you guys are like a different type of like animal. Like it rowers. Was, Holy it was crap, wild. Y'all are it was. Impressive. <laughs> it was. It, it was pretty cool. I learned how to row in my freshman year. At first, I was like, "Yeah, sounds great. I miss being on a team. Let me join your team." I found out what time they worked out, and I was like, I am not waking up at 4 a.m. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I didn't do it initially, and then halfway through my freshman year, I was like, okay, I like really miss being on a team. So then I had someone teach me how to row, join the team, and rowed the last three years. But just being in sports as, you know, growing up, I knew that I wanted to do something in human performance. Um, I really didn't know what. Uh, my second semester, my sophomore year, I took a class for – one to be a physical therapist, one to be a nurse, one to be a physician assistant, one for nutrition. Cause I was like, all right, you gotta figure it out. Um, and then love the nutrition class. I also had a teammate who told me about a sports nutrition class. Um, and once I took that, I think my junior year, it was, I literally called my dad after and I was like, I know what I wanna be when I grow up. Um, so that was kind of a, just where it all started. And then literally from that point, I've just been doing everything I can to get different experiences to kind of figure out what do I enjoy doing? What types of athletes, what types of environments do I enjoy being in? Um, so on, after undergrad, I, um, didn't really know at the time if sports nutrition was really a field. This was maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, so after undergrad, I just got a volunteer position with the USA field hockey team. They were based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, near my hometown. So Moved back home, interned about 20 hours a week for them before the Rio Olympic Games. Um, and that right there was enough just to pique my interest in like really wanting to go all in. Um, ended up going to grad school uh, after that year. Went to Florida State. Um, got my master's in exercise physiology with a major in sports nutrition. <clears throat> and then it was at that program at Florida State that I also did what's called a dietetic internship, which is basically tack on another year of school where you do a bunch of different rotations in like clinical community and food service nutrition. So I had to work in like a hospital, university health services, um, the Florida state dining hall. So a bunch of different rotations, but all of that kind of culminated in me taking an exam to become a registered dietitian. Um, after grad school, I landed a seasonal internship in the NFL with the bears. Um, and that was, I think I learned more in that year than I did in the seven years of school prior. It was unbelievable experience. Shout out Jennifer Gibson, my mentor to this day. Um, and then it was from that seasonal internship. I then landed my first, I guess, official full-time job, um, at a company called Exos in Phoenix, Arizona, which is, I kind of just describe it as a a big training facility where a lot of people go in the off season to train. So anywhere from, MLB, NHL, they're a big NFL combine program that they have there, a little bit of NBA combine as well. So um, I actually interned there while I was in grad school. And then when I finished up at the Bears, they were opening a full-time position. Got lucky enough to to be brought on full-time there and was there for about two years. Um, And then COVID hit. And because we were a training facility, we opened and closed every month, it felt like, in that first Yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah, so I was like, oh, you're for load again. I'm like, all right, cool. What do we do? So um, during Some of that us abided time, by the rules and some of us didn't. <clears throat> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was definitely an interesting time. But um, during that time, it was crazy timing because one of the, basically a small, um, kind of call it like wellness concierge company based in Boston. They were just starting up and looking for a <clears throat> dietitian to come on board. I met them because they came in toward Exos' facility um, and they reached out the second time our facility closed and were like, hey, do you need a job? And I was like, you know, I might. Um, I ended up deciding to leave Exos to work virtually for this company, which 
also allowed me to move to Colorado, which I had spent time here and there between different positions, um, just because I simply love it out here. Um, moved to Colorado, worked for this virtual company, also was brought on as a dietitian at a sports med company out here. Um, and in the meantime, to get us to kind of where we are at the Nuggets today, I had reached out to the Broncos dietitian who I met years prior when I was interning with the Bears. We did a whole season out here preseason. So I had met him, kept in touch with him. And then probably six months to a year after being back in Colorado, he reached out to me and was like, hey, the Nuggets are looking for a contractor. Are you interested? And I've been there since. I kind of my first season went on board as a contractor while kind of still doing the sports med company and the virtual company. Um, and then second season was brought on full time. And now I just have one job. So it's great. <laughs> nice. So yeah, so, long winded answer. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's, it's great. That's awesome. You've had some incredible experiences and gotten to work with some awesome teams and organizations. That, that's great. But How- one thing you said though, was, was I think that John and I both would agree with a hundred percent. And that is, Nothing against a college classroom. Okay, yes, I have a lot of problems with Yeah, I mean, we can talk about this all day. Let's let's be honest. Oh, yeah, no doubt. But but (laughs) nothing beats real world experience, right? I mean, that's like, it doesn't matter what the field is. You've got to get out. You've got to get, you've got to like get in the mud a little bit and you've got to, you've got to actually do the job. And no amount of learning from a textbook, at least for me, uh, Mm -hmm. is going to do, is going to, is going to, give you that experience you've got to actually get out there in the field and do it right almost everything i've implemented at the nuggets i think back to where i learned this and where i first did this and that was at the bears in my first like full-time internship position so that leads me to kind of the uh, kind of a two-part question but part one is like what led you into the nutritional component like because you you'd mentioned that you were doing it you tried a bunch of different things and i know just personally being in the performance and you know wellness rehab fields the nutrition side of it like is the thing that interests me the least <laughs> like, <Yeah. we're> <laughs> i appreciate what, what the of, honesty <laughs> i would yeah, agree to an real. extent <laughs> you know I, i'm just being real um yeah. that's why i always refer out <laughs> for sure for sure but, um like what but what sparked your interest about that like how, when did you make that decision? Great question. I mean, I agree with you 100% for part of that, half of that question. I think when I took that first nutrition class, when I was kind of taking it the same time as the other classes, first off, physics, I could not get through. So PT was out of the question. Um, so that <laughs> made that really easy. But then when I was taking the nutrition class, that was just basic human nutrition. For some reason, I was that sparked my interest, but not enough to be like, okay, I'm going to go be a dietitian. It wasn't until I took that sports nutrition class where I was able, like I'm in front of my eyes was seeing like, okay, my interest in nutrition, but also my interest in sports that I've known my whole life and I would love to work in seeing those kind of come together and then waiting a little bit of time and figuring out like, is this, are there jobs in this field? And it was very slowly starting to build up. Um, but even my mentor at, um, Penn State as well. The sports dietitian who was one of the first sports dietitians ever, I think her name is Dr. Christine Clark. She taught that sports nutrition class and was also the director of nutrition, sports nutrition at Penn State. So she was working with football, basketball, and a couple of the other um, teams at the time. I just went up to her at the end of class and was like, do you take volunteers? Can I help you? Is there anything I can do to make your life easier and to learn from you? Um, In the last years at Penn State, I did just that. So I think just finding the interest and kind of combining best of both worlds for me, but then putting it into play and seeing like, okay, like I love doing this. Can I find a way to get a career out of this? Um, And luckily the field has evolved immensely since then, but it was, that was really just the, if it was just nutrition, I would not just be a dietitian because a lot of dietitians, they work in hospitals and no offense to any of that, but I just could not last a day in a hospital. So I did not do that. To the second part of that question yeah. is like, what is, <laughs> this is going to sound like a really stupid question. <laughs> um, that's why these are conversations, not interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> like, what is the true role of a dietitian? Like, because I think a lot of people would just say, oh, it's, you know, your, your macros. But yeah. it goes a lot deeper than that. Yeah. So like, what is the true think, role in your words? I think if we kind of get specific into sports, like really 
what I think of myself as is just an individual helping to educate athletes to understand first what nutrition is, but then also how they can use that to their advantage. Like how can they use nutrition to fuel their body, to help improve sleep, to impact their recovery, um, a number of things to help them get back from injury faster. Like how can they use it to their advantage? Cause their ultimate goal is to be the best that they can be at their sport. Um, so really just helping them to understand that this is something that you can use as leverage to kind of one up in a sense, your competitor, if that's not something that they're focusing on. So that's, I think the overall rule. And then when you kind of get into that, it, the details of that are, yes, there's macronutrient nutrition, which is like carbs, protein, and fat. That's what we use to fuel our body, but then there's also micronutrient of the vitamin, vitamins and minerals and are we lacking in certain nutrients that we need to either supplement with or get more of in our you know day-to-day nutrition. There's also hydration. Um, so I think there's, you can really zoom in on lots of different parts, but I think big picture, it's just as a dietitian, like how can I help athletes to, to be better at what they want to be better at? So let, let's get a little bit more specific on what you yeah. just said, okay? Yeah. You mentioned, you know, we can use nutrition to help recover from an injury. We can use nutrition to improve performance. Yeah. Give us an idea. All right, so I'm sure you see sprained ankles, you know, mm-hmm. knee injuries, whatever, probably shoulder, back, whatever. Yeah. How, give us an example, not, not of a specific individual, okay, but yeah. just an example. How can nutrition help me recover from that sprained ankle? Or from that torn ACL or that, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Lots of different components. Um, The first that comes to mind is if you think of, like, say, a season-ending injury where we've got an athlete out all season, body composition is going to – there's it's going to be a big factor kind of in that recovery process and kind of maintaining where they want to be when they're maybe not as active as they have been or that as they're used to being. Um, So really helping to educate on, like, what their nutrient and their energy needs are given their kind of newer or short-term but newer activity level. Um, but also looking into like preseason with um, the Nuggets, we'll do blood biomarker testing. So everyone on physical day does a full panel um, and we're looking at certain nutrients like vitamin D where vitamin D we can get a tiny bit from certain foods, but we really get it from the sun. Um, that's our biggest source. When you're playing a sport indoors, all year round, you're not getting a ton of sun. So that's something that we'll look into, especially if it's a bone injury, um, but muscle injuries as well are affected by vitamin D levels. So making sure that athletes are optimizing those levels with, with, with vitamin D specifically, we're then supplementing. Cause there's, like I said, there's not a lot of foods that you can, you know, eat a ton of to get what you need. So we're adding in supplementation for guys to make sure that their micronutrient levels are where they need to be for their body to recover, whether it's from a bone injury or whatnot so those are just a couple examples what um, what is the a day in the life <laughs> for a sports <laughs> nutritionist looks like at your level I mean because you made the comment you know earlier like kind of working in you know like the nugget setting it's much more personal yeah um, you know but so just how does it work at that level and then I do want to kind of get back into some of the detailed stuff yeah um, every day is is very different um, whether it's a home game, away game, just a practice day, an off day. Um, I guess kind of in summary, just to give you an idea of like what my day-to-day looks like in preseason, um, it's much more nutrition specific. So that's when we do our biomarker testing. I'll then review all of those results and make suggestions for supplements for each individual. Um, we'll put together supplement packs based on those blood, based on that blood work. Um, We'll also in preseason do things like sweat sodium testing, which is really cool science um, from Gatorade. They're they're pretty big into that where we're able to kind of measure someone's sweat concentration, like how much electrolytes are they losing, what types of electrolytes, how much volume, so then we can make recommendations for in-season and in-games. Are they a salty sweater and they need a lot of electrolytes during a game um, or not so much and maybe just, you know, water and a small snack at halftime can kind of help replete that. Or that is really that. interesting. I did not we can know go that down the whole like rabbit that. hole. Of that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> once yeah, we I, get, go ahead. No, you go ahead, please. I was just going to say once we get um, in season, it's very food heavy. Um, so I, 
coordinate all of the meals, whether it's at home, I'll work with our in-house caterer on menus. And when it's away, there's a fully catered meal on every flight at every arena pregame, every arena postgame, you know, John. Um, and so coordinating that, making sure everyone has what they need, they need, but really just... It's a lot um, of work. It's dude. so much. <laughs> a lot of logistics, um, yeah. which I, I feel like I'm pretty organized, so it, it works out well. But um, that's kind of the second priority in season is just making sure that they have options to eat throughout the day. Because when we're talking about six foot, seven foot guys, like... They need a lot, a lot of energy to kind of get through the day and meet their needs. So having that accessible is is a big part of what I do in season. That was actually going to be my question. What is a typical calorie intake for for your typical pro basketball player? I'm very curious. Like, what's a daily calorie intake? We're going to have a lot of jealous people listening to to your answer there. I mean, I don't know if I can give you a specific, but if you consider, like, we've got ranging from six foot to seven foot literally on our roster – um, but then you take into account, are these guys, are they starters? Are they returning from injury? Are they maybe not starters and they're kind of on the fringe? So they're showing up to extra practices. So it really depends on like, what is their expenditure? Um, what is their size? What is their body composition goal? We've got some players who are more conscious of kind of just trying to maintain in season. And then we've got other players where they're like, I need to eat 24 seven in order to even try to get to the goal that I want to be at. So it's very different, but thousands and thousands and thousands of calories, even for, I mean, baseline, I would say 300,000 for the smallest player. It's, yeah, it's a lot, a lot of food. So when you, when you're doing, you're doing things like that and you're putting the meal plans together, like I've you know, I, I've worked with some NBA guys. I've, I've traveled around with them, you know, and like during the off season or even during the season. And like, I know a lot of them have their own personal chefs as well. Yeah. So like, is that something that, you know, you guys kind of coordinate and work with, or is that, or are they just kind of like doing that on the side? A little, a little bit of both. There's some that have kind of had a chef for their family for years and they've, they've kind of got their own system. Um, we do have some starters that I will work directly with their personal chef, um, especially when guys have more of a particular body composition goal. Um, I work directly with the chef. I've created a particular plan with things like macronutrients and recommended portion sizes for the chef to kind of portion out um, for for lunch and dinner, especially when they're not eating at the facility, maybe on a practice day or an off day. Um, I'll work with the chef just on scheduling of like, here's what my best guess is of what our schedule will look like. Um, Because day to day, we usually don't know our schedule until the day before. We'll have a good idea, but nothing finalized. So I'll kind of put together that rough template for them so they know, like, when are they going to need certain meals provided. But that's definitely, especially with such a small roster, that's one of the things that I really enjoy being able to do is working with, you know, those that are helping the athletes outside of the facility. Um, In the past, we've had rookies that are 18, 19 years old, and when they come to us, I've had the team be like, how about you just get on the phone with his mom? Because she's in town. She's going to be doing most of the cooking and the grocery shopping. So I hopped on the phone with a new player's mom. And I'm like, hey, I hear you're, you're doing the cooking. <laughs> so it's whatever is going to help them. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, the, to think a professional athlete. Yeah, they still, they still live at home. Yeah, that'd be, that'd I mean, be pretty cool, 18. actually. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's now, pretty cool scenario. how does uh, we, you kind of touched on it a little bit? Like you talked about the vitamin, the role the vitamin D plays in that, in yeah. that, and particularly you know when you're under all this artificial light mm-hmm. all the time, not getting much sun. But um, kind of digging back into some of these details now, like since you've worked across the spectrum with some different sports, like what is I guess what what have you found to be unique about basketball that's maybe different than football? That is a great question. I think, I mean, specifically vitamin D, that's Thank you. from I throw, a micronutrient perspective. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's a great one because I've yeah. never, <laughs> over big picture, um, the blood results come back pretty impressive um, with the one asterisk being vitamin D because we are inside all day long, all year long, unless, you know, the very short off season that we just had. Um, maybe they got a little bit of sunlight, but that's definitely the one thing I've noticed from a micronutrient perspective. Um I think what's been interesting too, even bigger picture is if you compare it to football, like when I was working with the Bears, it was, you know, a large roster, maybe between the ages of 21 and 26 for majority. 
in basketball, we've got a 21 year old and we've got a 35 or 36 year old and there's only 15 to 17 of them. So it's just the spectrum of like where these guys are at in like in their, in that stage of life, we've got guys fresh out of college that, you know, Uber eats is their off day choice. And then we've got guys with three kids who have a private chef at home cooking for their family on off day. So I think that's been something that's really interesting that makes basketball a little bit different really just off the court is like the individuals you're working with can be in very different stages of life and nutrition wise, different preferences, different priorities, um, things like that. Ooh, we'd, we'd love to get Jack Cruz take on all that, <laughs> especially the vitamin D part, uh, John. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no doubt. Are, do you, are you familiar with Dr. Cruz's work at all? A hey, little bit. Jack Cruz. Yeah. Heard of him. <clears throat> Yeah, he's he's, he's a little bit of he's a little bit opinionated, but he's yeah. very informative. That's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to give him a listen. Yeah. yeah, what what are some of the biggest challenges um, that you <clears throat> that you deal with? I know you kind of touched on you know the athletes being at different stages of their life, and you know I can recall some certain basketball players that might have come out of Memphis that were their diet was um, gummy worms. Um, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> like what, what are some of the biggest challenges that you see or deal with? I think one of the, I guess, even more recent things that we've been working through is we have a new catering company um, in-house at the arena that started the season. They're great. Um, but trying to figure out when you have that 15 year age range and then you factor in staff trying to figure out like what is going to please the most amount of people. Um, because we've got guys that if they could choose, they would have spaghetti and meatballs before the game and they would have chicken fingers and mac and cheese after the game and they would do that every single day of their life. But then there's other people that, you know, just have different palates, um, different preferences. So I think kind of with that different stage of life and just different personalities and different backgrounds, kind of figuring out what are meals we can put on the table that people will eat that aren't, you know standard chicken, broccoli, and rice to use the cliche dietitian example. Like the goal is to give them enough variety in such a long season that they're going to continue to eat the food that we give them. So it's, you know, when we are on the road, pregame meal, whether it's, I guess, home or away, it's, it's pretty simple and standard. Um, We'll have a chicken, a beef, a fish, a starch, a veggie. We keep it simple on purpose. We try to avoid any heavy creams or spicy foods so we don't have guys running back to the locker room during the game. Um, But then at post game, that's where we'll play around a little bit and give them the foods that they're used to and that they want. So they play in New York City tomorrow night and they have pizza post game Um, because you're in New York, you want pizza. Um, Same thing with like when they're in Philly, we'll do cheesesteaks. Memphis, we did wings. So it's it's not doing that every post game because there is this huge importance of what you're eating post game to replenish kind of what you're, what you're burning during that game. Um, but I think for the sake of just variety and sustainability, it's really important to kind of give the guys a taste of what they want as well. And really just kind of finding the balance throughout it all. Well, mm-hmm. let's dig, let's dig into that right there. Yeah. You, you made a, a comment of it's important. It's very important what they're eating post game. Yeah. And I know, you know, for myself, I mean, I work with you know a lot of, a lot of baseball guys. I, I mean, we work with some soccer, so I mean, more anaerobic versus aerobic. But like, you know, for you know basketball, I guess just specifically, like, yeah. um, go through that post game a little bit more, and like how some of the needs maybe um, vary. I guess based on you know more like aerobic dominant sports like soccer or basketball versus something like for football sure. or baseball. For sure. Um, so post game, like say it's post game at home, we we have a handful of players that will actually go lift after that game, which is it's been on social media for a lot of teams doing that. A lot of teams do do that. It's not out of the norm. Um, but as soon as the game ends, I will make um, just post-game shakes for guys that played a lot. Um, and that'll include, you know, protein powder. But we've also got things like collagen in there to help with tendon and ligament support. Um, we'll put creatine in, in there to help maintain muscle mass throughout the season. Um, and then it's simple. It's a banana and peanut butter is the team favorite across the board. Um, so that is kind of, I'll make that and then that'll go into the locker room. So as soon as they're done with that lift, they're drinking that shake. So it's, it's kind of like almost an appetizer for recovery before they get to the post game meal, um, just to kind of help jumpstart recovery. A lot of people are aware of, you know, they call it the window of opportunity where as soon as you're done training, that's really when your muscles are able to 
best take in the nutrients you're giving them. So adding in that shake immediately after for the guys that played a lot. And then once they shower, get through media obligations, then they'll come to the post game meal where sometimes they'll sit down. A lot of times they just take it to go and they go home and eat it. Um, but that's similar to the, the buffet for pregame that I mentioned. We always have three proteins, um, starch, vegetables, um, as well as just we've got a grab and go fridge, which has a lot of things that they can take, take home snack wise, like Greek yogurt, fruit cups, string cheese, stuff like that. So maybe it's, you know, they're having their post game meal at home and then even maybe a snack later after that. Why a banana? <laughs> carbohydrate and it's simply like i've even asked i'm like can we try something new and they're like no this is it it's the wendy's frosty um but so personal preference but the carbohydrate um really just to help replenish so you've probably heard of when we're training carb is the main energy source it's the main energy source for a body to get through the day whether you're a high schooler in class or you're an nba star on the court um but that's really what we're using as energy so to help replenish that after they've burned through that in the game um, is is why we go for things like banana and why there's things like pasta, potatoes, rice, things like that at post game as well. Yeah, it seems like I vaguely remember reading something along the line of, you know, the the best source of carbs that so, that like an athlete can use. I have no idea if this, <laughs> if this is true or not. This is just what I remember reading yeah. or hearing. It was like a banana or honey, just honey. Yeah, and probably simple. honey on a banana would be, you Delicious. know, probably would probably be even better. <laughs> but that's, yeah. you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that would be true or not. So I'm not suggesting every athlete out there to go eat honey and a banana. But you know, it's <laughs> it seems to come from a good source. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. I just, good... The banana is just a kind of a, a, a hot. I don't want to say it's a hot button issue here by any <laughs> means, but it is. It's something that I'll usually talk to the athletes about, like that we have, or even some general fitness, like. You know, when it comes to the fruit, like in general, you know, a banana is kind of like my least favorite. But I can understand when it comes, not because I, I love bananas, but just because the glycine, it's, it's so high. Yeah. And I guess the requirements for a professional athlete are quite a bit different than your gen pop or high school athlete or something like that. For sure. So that's why I just thought the banana was uh, <laughs> was an interesting. Either um, way, it's like if you think of what they're burning in right. in that game. It's like we, that's almost ideal. It's like we want the most carbohydrates to get in as soon as possible to kind of help jumpstart that recovery. Um, Is it maybe not the best snack just to have the banana if you're, you know, someone sitting at home on the couch not doing anything? It'll give you a little boost of energy, but for not really any purpose. Um, So I think there are different times where maybe it's not as um, impactful, but definitely post game. And it's, again, it's personal preference. It's, you know, I could give them a shake to give them different nutrients, but if they're not going to drink it, what's the point? So right. going after Well, that's what, what I mean, like. kids will ask me a lot of times, same thing they ask John. And I'm like, well, you know, should I have a you know banana just for example? Well, I mean, do you, do you like bananas? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's my main question. Do you like them? Then eat yeah. it, you know, whatever. But then again, I mean, we're talking about dealing with, you know, mostly high school age kids. So it's not, yeah. you know, not exactly, we're not going to, put on just a bunch of bulk through their middle or anything at this stage. (laughs) So, so the nutrition side of stuff, especially over the last probably what 15 years or so Mm -hmm. has really exploded. I feel like in professional and collegiate um, athletics. I mean, this is not the days of Mickey Mantle and, you know, Babe Ruth and where they're eating, you know, beer or drinking (laughs) beer and, you know, hot dogs before a game. I mean, athletes are taking this um, very seriously and and it's Mm -hmm. bleeding down into the high school levels too. And, you know, it's, there's no question that the high school kids that actually follow, you know, their nutrition closely as best they can, they are ultimately the ones that get more often than not the, the highest level of results. But so this industry has really, it's changed. It's become very important. Like where, where is this industry headed? Like, meaning like, what are some of the advancements and things that you guys are seeing in this industry that, um, you know, we didn't know five years ago, um, but we're learning now, like you talk about the sweat test, you know, and things like that, like kind of where are things headed with this? I think, I mean, what you mentioned, just nutrition as a whole, becoming much more important, people realizing they can use it to their advantage. Um, One of the things we'll do preseason with, 
any new play that player, whether it's a rookie coming out of college or just a new player from a different team is I'll sit down and do just a, a nutrition assessment with them to get an understanding of like, what is your background? Have you worked with a dietitian before? Is nutrition something you've put priority on? Um, and it's increasingly becoming more of like, yes, I had a dietitian in college and we worked on X, Y, or Z, where I think if you think years back, it's like, we have a what? What's a dietitian? Like, what is a nutritionist? Like, why are we focusing on this? Like, I got to where I am because of, you know, I ate whatever I wanted. But I think kind of switching the mindset and realizing like, okay, yes, I got to where I am maybe by doing what I've been doing, but I can get to what level by putting more of a focus on nutrition, if that makes sense. So I think even just the the collegiate, like there are hundreds of dietitians at the collegiate level right now. There's some universities that have six or seven dietitians. Um, and I think that's really where it's changing the game where guys are coming in with just a lot more knowledge and even respect for nutrition and interest in nutrition to be able to kind of use it to their advantage. So I'm going to, I'm going to say something that might be kind of controversial, uh -oh. uh, which I'm known no. to do periodically. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Let's hear but, it. Yeah. All right. So in, in this field, I guess, whether sports, you know, related or even, um, you know, I guess just general population or hospitals or what have you, what is like your take and is there any type of, uh, you know, of implementation of, you know, more organic, holistic, healthy foods? Because we know, I mean, it's fact, GMOs and what goes on in this process, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, granted, I understand you've got a lot of big, tall guys to feed, <laughs> <laughs> right? So yeah. like, there's some give and take, but is that something that is actually considered and brought to the table at this level? Like the quality uh, from a GMO standpoint and like mm -hmm. how the body essentially is able to even assimilate it. Like, cause if your pH levels are out of whack, like the assimilation process is going to be altered, it, particularly when you're introducing things with a lot of GMOs or artificial things. So like, mm -hmm. just what's your take on that and how, how does the industry kind of address this? Yeah. I think we could go down the rabbit hole, but I would say um, with the with the team specifically, we've, from a budget standpoint, they've been very open to whatever we need nutritionally. Um, so that has not put any any barrier on can we pay the highest price for the best type of product. I think where it gets controversial then is say we're talking about a high school athlete who's maybe paying for his own lunch. Um, personal opinion. I don't think I would rather you, you know, go for the meal that's going to give you the best nutrition, the best amount of protein, carbohydrates, healthy fats compared to if it's an organic non-GMO meal or snack. Um, that's my personal opinion, but it, it also plays into, you know, what are this person's resources um, and how much money are you spending as, you know, just an own individual that's not a professional athlete with endless resources. Um, you know, if you don't have those resources, I don't want people to think like, Oh, you know, it's, it's not a good snack because it's not non GMO. Um, if that makes sense, but I think we could, yeah. we could well, definitely you, go down the rabbit hole with that. And well, I can so tell, I can tell this is a, this is a, this is an interesting <laughs> topic for you here. Like, I, and I think it is because I think it all goes into the healing process as well. I mean, we know mm -hmm. that, you know, there's plenty of, you know, um, you know, there's steroids, there's all kinds of medications pumped into the animals. I mean, there's microplastics and all this type of stuff, which obviously, mm -hmm. you know, messes with the endocrine system. And I mean, it just, it goes on and on and on. And right. I think it's just extremely important, like extremely important. Yeah, I agree. I also just, I wouldn't want someone to, to not choose a certain option that would be healthy for them. If it's, if it, if they're, you know, overthinking it and kind of going down this rabbit hole of like, I can't have this, 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 or this. And a lot of times people will do that and be like, well, what's left that I can afford. Um, right. so I well, well, you know, years ago though, I mean, I'm a lot older, older than either one of you, but <laughs> if, but I, you yes, know, I yes, remember you are. Very <laughs> yes, I am, but it's, you know, back in the day, <laughs> if you will, you could not get blueberries, uh, Outside of you know June and July, right, you know right. in it's the southeast, right. you could not get a watermelon that wasn't loaded with seeds. Mm -hmm. There was no such thing. So I remember the days specifically that John's referring to. Um, of you can tell what's a GMO and what's not. Right. And I've often wondered, you know, that along that same line, is that watermelon that has no seeds in the middle of it for example or those big old plump blueberries that you buy in january is that even the same thing 
are they nutrient deficient or are they nutrient rich? I have no earthly idea, (laughs) you know? And so, you know, I actually, I I think that's a great question there, John. I mean, I think that's like a a rabbit hole that we probably ought to explore, you know? Well, it's something we talk about. I mean, you know, we discuss openly in our facility um, because I think, you know, and and Abby, I mean, call me out if I'm wrong. Like, please, <laughs> you're you're the you're the professional here. But like, I think the food quality in America is extremely poor. I think we are misled as to what we actually have available and the good, you know, the good foods that we have. Um, and I think that's part of or it's it's not part of it's a huge contributing factor to the obesity epidemic that we have. Like, right. when you actually look at the statistics, and remind me if I'm wrong, but like the statistics actually show that. At this time in human history, we actually consume less calories than we did back in the 50s, yet we are, what, I think obesity is at an all-time high, diabetes is at an all-time high. So it's like people keep thinking like, oh, I'm not, I'm eating too much. It's like, no, you're not. It's actually what's in the food that's messing everything up, that's overstressing the liver, that's pushing all these, you know, toxins into your fat and storing them there. I don't know. (laughs) To an extent. (laughs) Because yeah. I think, I mean, I am by no means an expert on this particular topic, but I think if you kind of go back to just big picture and if, you know, if you think of, you're talking about blueberries being, you know, whether it's GMO or non-GMO comparing the nutrition of them, they're still going to have antioxidants in them. It's still going to be a lower calorie carbohydrate source. So it's kind of comparing this to say we're compare it to a Big Mac stuff like that where it's like that's still not an equal comparison but you're able to if people I don't want to put too much fear on like there's GMOs in this stay away from this so I'm just gonna eat what I know and it's fast food type thing so I think there is like we're now taking healthy foods and calling them out for not being healthy which a lot of time then turns people into going back to what they know which is fast food so it's almost just trying to not put too much pressure because we I mean I'm sure to an extent there's going to be, you know, GMO versus non-GMO. There is a difference, but in the big picture, like macronutrient standpoint of like, we need protein, carbs, and healthy fat, is it still going to give us what we need if, you know, we're on a a low budget or stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, you've seen, at least I've seen the TikTok reel. I'm sure y'all have seen the TikTok, Instagram reels of like, you know, the people being like, okay, well, I was told to eat eggs. Oh, wait, eggs are bad. Okay, I was told to eat blueberries. Everything's bad. bad. And so it's like, yeah, everything's bad for you. So the guy's just like eating an ice cube. Like, Eggs are great. <laughs> Blueberries are great. Right. That's what yeah, I'm trying. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. There's just, there's so much fear across the board. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think just that, that's an area that I've, I've, I'm, I'm passionate about. I think is very interesting because I really personally believe that it, there's a lot there and I do think that's it right. plays a huge role in our, you know, natural just health, but also optimizing performance. Yeah. Um, so here's kind of where I want to, I want to follow or, um, you know, kind of close things out here is like Chris and I, for the most part, work with the you know, majority high school, middle school athletes. I mean, we work with plenty of college and pro guys, but, um, yeah. you know, most of our audience is going to be that high school age, um, kid. Awesome. What, what advice can you give to these parents, to these coaches, to these kids, that they can start to implement because they are confused. Yeah. A lot of families yeah. are confused because of what we just talked about. Right. Like, what advice can you give them? <laughs> Stay away from what we just talked about. Don't, don't look too far into it. <laughs> don't listen just to kidding, it. Just kidding. Yeah. Just kidding. Yeah. Skip um, over that part. <laughs> I mean, I think even relating it back to the nuggets, I mentioned like the goal for me is to have options available to them. So if you're a parent listening to this, just having options available for your kids. Um, I've actually worked with a lot of high schoolers Um, just on the side from whatever position I've had at the time. And a lot of times it's like, I want to put on muscle or I just want to know how to fuel for my sport or I'm, I'm dragging. I feel like I have low energy. So giving the athletes just the food options available to them, but also educating them, educating them on like why you should wake up and eat breakfast versus roll right out of bed and, you know, not eat anything till lunch. So the importance of breakfast, um, as well as even just having snacks throughout the class you know, I know it depends on the school I'm learning, but a lot of teachers let you eat in class. So what are options that we can, you know, bring to class and eat during class? So you have that energy to get you through the day and you don't have an empty gas tank when you get to practice after school. Um, so whether it's a Greek yogurt cup or a 
hummus cup with pretzels or any type of bar or applesauce. Like these are all things that we have in the nuggets. Again, like we're feeding 19, 20 year olds. It's basically like a high schooler. So it's just having those snacks available for them and then helping to, to understand why they need that and when they should have that, you know, before practice, having some type of snack, um, at halftime, we have a cart of snacks and you might think it's super fancy. We've got applesauce packets, bananas, peanut butter and jellies, Welch's fruit snacks. Um, we've tried Uncrustables. hundred percent. Exactly. <laughs> like that whole Uncrustables blew up and I'm like, if that's going to give them fuel, like if you have, I don't even know if this exists, but say you have like this organic non GMO tastes like shit, peanut butter and jelly, they're not going to eat that. So it's like having what they will eat. That's going to be the better option for our guys at halftime, having something versus nothing. Um, so same for high school, like just getting in the energy so that you can use that during practice as well as then at the end of the day, prioritizing dinner and, you know, not skipping that to do your homework, finding time so that you can kind of refuel your body to get ready to do it all over again the next day. <laughs> nice. That's great. That's great advice. Well, um, Abby, this has been a lot of fun. Um, yeah. You are the first like nutritionist that we've had join the show. And, nice. Um, this was this was cool, um, man. I think there's just <laughs> there's so many things that we can go down. For um, sure. Because it is. It's just it's such an, a vital role in performance and recovery. Um, For sure. So, um, if people want to you know follow you, I mean, what <laughs> where can they find you? Um, I, I'm not on a ton of socials. I do have a personal Instagram. It's Abby Lathrop corn okay. with a K. Um, a lot of times LinkedIn, like younger students interested in the field, they'll reach out to me on LinkedIn. So Abby Lathrop, um, always happy to chat, hop on a call with people if they've got questions about nutrition or even just the field of nutrition and being a dietitian. So reach out to me on there. Cool. Cool. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you guys. Yeah. This is, uh, this has been fun. And so like uh, guys, as we said, uh, you know, we just asked if you got value out of this, just share the show. I don't know how you didn't get value out of this when <laughs> the nutritionist for the Denver Nuggets tells you that nutrition is important. I'm pretty sure they just won a world championship. I think you might want to listen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, Abby, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. And yeah, Thank hopefully we get to Thank do you. this again, you know? Yeah. Keep me posted. Right. We can go down more rabbit holes. We'll talk about Let's sweat testing next it. time. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, All right. Abby. Guys, that's yeah. the show. Share the show. Appreciate you guys. Love you guys.